excuse the gloom, but none may know of this meeting. The nature of my trouble is darker still. There's been no new music genres in the last 20 years. Well, time to dig into the crypts then. Dungeon Synth is a pure internet genre, abandoning even the last vestiges of reality found in Vaporwave. Dungeon Synth veers between romanticism of a fake past and a fake future. Dungeon Synth delights or mourns in the fantasy of pure concept and aesthetics. Dungeon Synth is a movement, but has no manifesto. So what is it then? Dungeon Synth is dreamy people in their bedrooms making music inspired by black metal, J.R.R. Tolkien, and early Dungeons & Dragons artwork. A brief definition that does this cohering collage of a genre no justice. Dungeon Synth is synth, in certain respects. Dungeon Synth, or DS for short, has existed since the 1990s, but the name was not coined until 2011. Before 2011, no Dungeon Synth artist thought they were a Dungeon Synth artist, and most early ones do not, nor ever will. They were part or parts of Dark Ambient, Neo Folk, Dark Wave, Neo Classical, Medieval Ambient, even Gothic Electronica music, or an increasingly obtuse list of descriptors. Dungeon Synth could be a graveyard of obscure genres, but these genres were fertilizer. On his codifying Dungeon Synth blog on March 17, 2011, Andrew Wardner opened up with this definition. Dungeon Synth is the sound of the ancient crypt, the breath of the tomb that can only be properly conveyed in music that is primitive, necro, lo-fi, forgotten, obscure, and ignored by all of mainstream society. When you listen to Dungeon Synth, you are making a conscious choice to spend your time in a graveyard, to stare, by candlelight, into an obscure tome that holds subtle secrets about places that all sane men avoid. These nebulous definitions cohere more into the idea of being in the past than unifying on their own account, but they truly are the obscure tomes that hold subtle secrets about places that all sane men avoid, although that definition might be a little long. Dungeon Synth did not truly exist until Andrew Wardner's Dungeon Synth blog developed the term in the early 2010s, but the genre has three distinct periods, some that predate the 2010s. Origins, 2000s, and Modern. All three eras will be briefly examined here in turn to see what was, is, and will be Dungeon Synth. How often something sits in front of people, invisible, until it has a name. It is difficult to place an exact, conclusive origin point for Dungeon Synth, but the current consensus favors an origin in black metal. One lineage of Dungeon Synth sees it as a natural outgrowth of the dark romantic synth intros and interludes of the 1990s Norwegian black metal scene and successors. In this respect, Dungeon Synth can be seen as a mushrooming of an in-between aspect of music, inflating the slow synths and lo-fi production of the era to its own genre. Another, but equally Northern European origin, places Dungeon Synth as a late descendant of the 1960s, 1970s Berlin music scene and its New Age synth Kosmisch Music, or Cosmic Music. Dungeon Synth is Dungeon Synth though, and can be considered and enjoyed on its own, without regards to its predecessors. In the realm of early artists, Dungeon Synth scholars, about the three of them online, point to Norwegian black metal artist Mortis, Halvor Elfsen, as the codifier of Dungeon Synth. Codifier here is a very exact term. Not creator, but codifier. Former bass player for the metal band Emperor, Mortis left the band in 1992-1993 to develop his own musical identity and the character of Mortis, a metal personality of the very Norwegian black metal scene and inspired by German artists like Tangerine Dream. Mortis was influenced by both early, what would later be considered, Dungeon Synth sources, both Norwegian and German. The image of Mortis has been polarizing in its own regard in metal, both for and against, but Mortis's post-Emperor ambient work is influential. It would come to be his Era 1 albums that embraced dark fantasy aspects, keyboard, and simple production. Of course, Mortis had no intention for his early work to be an Era 1 of anything. Like the genre he would later influence, Mortis's Era 1 would exist more in retrospect and similarity in sound than in actual concept. Mortis's Era 1 stretches from 1993 to 1999, with the Mortis albums and alternate projects, I'm not even going to try to say them in Norwegian, The Song of a Long Forgotten Ghost, 1993, Born to Rule, 1994, 
The Spirit Who Rebelled, 1994, Emperor of a Dimension Unknown, 1995, the highly consequential to Dungeon Synth Crypt of the Wizard from 1996, The Stargate 1999, and his Fata Morgana project, Fata Morgana 1995, and the later brief science fiction The Space Race Slash Robot City 1996. The music video for 1995 should also be mentioned. It's 24 minutes of Mortis wandering around a foggy, dilapidated castle, filmed on about $300 according to him, but it is an early visualization of what would inspire Dungeon Synth along with album covers and fantasy artwork. All are the visual and sonic ancestors of Dungeon Synth as a genre, but Mortis does not consider himself to be a Dungeon Synth artist. He is not opposed to the term and concept, but considers his own artistic vision to have predated the concept itself, which it actually did. Mortis generally stands alone. Mortis, after all, predates the term Dungeon Synth by almost two decades. Mortis's Era 1 albums compose the core, or raw materials for what would later be Dungeon Synth, but Mortis's The Stargate and Fata Morgana projects are interesting as well. Beyond the cover, which many may see as a little too boisterous, The Stargate embraces medieval style, sound, and instrumentation in a way that very much prefigures Dungeon Synth. Its heavy use of vocals, chanting, and choirs is somewhat foreign to later Dungeon Synth styles, but it is not a known. Fata Morgana embraces more of the gothic pseudo-lo-fi production style. Mortis, or I should say Elfson, considers Fata Morgana to have been a project totally divorced from Mortis in concept. It could be seen as him stripping away the last material vestiges of black metal present in his Era 1 work to make it pure synthesizer. He described the almost ephemeral artistic concept as, Fata Morgana is basically me wanting to express musical ideas through another medium that had no real concept but didn't deal with something special or had any message within. The name Fata Morgana itself ought to justify me when I say that music is sort of an illusion, a kind of vision if you like. Perhaps the word fits Mortis best, but heck. In both cases, Mortis says he was listening to the Conan the Barbarian soundtrack 1982 at the time, so the cinematic production style was present in development. A major part of the music was to be disconnected from reality, like Dungeon Synth, but Mortis has regularly admitted he knows next to nothing about Dungeon Synth as a movement, or the Dungeonites as he calls them. He appreciates that people credit his influence though. While his Era 2 and Era 3 albums saw a departure from the independent Era 1 style to a more dark industrial style, also expanding Mortis to a full band and performance, he made a return to the Era 1 aesthetic in 2020 with Spirit of Rebellion. He credits that return to both a healthier relationship with his early music, and says the exploding interest in genres like Dungeon Synth made him regain interest in the early Mortis identity. The mask, if you will. Even with the revival, Ellison warns Mortis is always changing, and that will always be true. Now, Urzum. Yes, it's time to talk about Varg. Yes, he killed the guy. Names Varg, Count Grishnak, or just the Count, Varg Vikernes, and on paper, Louis Cachette, among others, him and Mortis do not like each other for reasons any familiarity with both will make apparent. Vikernes is either the most infamous or famous person to emerge from the Norwegian black metal scene. He ranks as one of the most controversial artists to ever exist, and he makes sure that legacy will persist. Still, while many would prefer the name Varg Vikernes be blacked out from the record, Varg's musical project Burzum's influence is too large to ignore. No matter how taboo many find Varg as a person, a majority of Dungeon Synth artists will acknowledge at least a passing familiarity with Burzum, if not outright enjoying it or crediting it as an influence. But there will not be any psychoanalyzing Varg or his beliefs here, because that has been done to death already, and Burzum as a concept largely resists any attempts to. Burzum is slash was technically a band, but beside a few session musicians on early albums, has been Varg alone for its entire existence. In musical philosophy, Burzum reflects Varg's self-styled pagan beliefs, which can best be described as provoking or confrontational. Recording for Burzum albums was one and done. Most songs were done in one take, the first, rarely edited, and performed on whatever was around in the studio. For example, Varg does not remember the instruments he used for most Burzum albums, and would use whatever microphone the studio technician gave him. For Philosophim, 1993, Varg claimed he actually asked for the worst microphone on hand. It was a helicopter headset. While classified as black metal, Philosophim was produced due to Varg's growing dissatisfaction with the Norwegian black metal scene, and the contentious stabbing of Euronymous would follow in 1994. 
In regards to Dungeon Synth, only two Burzum albums need be mentioned beside Philosophim. Both produced post Varg sentencing in 1994. The pair are often referred to as Varg, or Burzum's prison albums. Daudi Baldur's 1997, Baldur's Death, and Ijjelf, named for Odin's Throne, 1999. Sorry if I mispronounced that. Both inspired by Norse paganism and Varg's own taste in fantasy, produced purely on keyboard because it was the only instrument Varg was allowed in prison. Due to that, the albums took on a synthesized style which was called Dark Ambient until the advent of the term Dungeon Synth. Post-release in 2009, Varg's music has since alternated between black metal and more synth styles, but his style is most definitely a predecessor of Dungeon Synth. While much can be said on Burzum, little of which has not, the music keeps a glow in the pale of Dungeon Synth. Varg's own unsteady relationship with Dungeon Synth, and a lot of things, is best captured by this quote. I think that Varg, quote, truly does reveal the same spirit which motivates Dungeon Synth, and even H.P. Lovecraft when it comes to the nostalgia for the fantasies and youth. The reeking bog is particularly interesting, since it is obviously negative, and it is that position he longs to recapture. There are a few other original Dungeon Synth forerunners to acknowledge here as well. Sigurd Wungraven slash Satyrs of the Norwegian black metal band Satyricons, independent project, Fell Dronen, 1995, another singular example of an early black metal artist striking out into Dungeon Synth territory prior to the advent of the genre label itself. The album is described as Northern Medieval Atmosphere Music by Seder of Satyricon. Seder did brand Fell Dronen under the project name Wangraven, but so far, it is the only material he has released under that name and style. Outside Norway, the German duo Depressive Silence has become retrospectively one of the major early Dungeon Synth names with their two albums, The Darkened Empires (1995) and Depressive Silence (1996). Interesting because Depressive Silence, excellent name, was actually a side project of the duo BS and Rall from the band Mightiest. Time, the internet, and YouTube has made Depressive Silence far more famous and a major cornerstone of Dungeon Synth. It is perhaps the best example of taking a former outlier in older styles and welding it into the Dungeon Synth canon. A mention on obscurity alone is M. Glev's Nozvel, 1996, a French band of proto Dungeon Synth substance. Little background is known on them beside what was printed on the cassette of their release. Discogs has it as This demo tape was limited to six copies only, for intolerant minds concept based on the lugubre atmospheres of Menesores, well, the dead winter. Yes, only six copies of this cassette were produced. It now has more than 10,000 views on YouTube. That's a lot of people for only six cassettes. That ends the overview of Dungeonson's origins in the 1990s, but the 2000s are a sort of dark age for the genre. And not dark age in the good Dungeon Synth way, but in an actual dark age of obscurity. It seems that certain experimental impulse that emerged in black metal moved on to other styles. The exact reasons for why are unclear, but there are a few good theories related to cultural pressure. It is likely the controversies and bludgeonings black metal had taken in the 1990s were having an impact. Artists such as Mortis were drifting to other genres, musicians like Varg were in prison, and others blamed commercialization. People were losing interest in that gloomy synth style. The fact the 2000s in Dungeon Synth are also not well catalogued also makes establishing chronology and influence difficult. Now, that is not to say synths died out completely. Dungeon Synth historian Captain Carbon has a theory related to their idea of Dungeon Synth's origins in the German Koschmisch music. By the 2000s, synth styles were becoming associated with New Age music that was vastly, vastly different from black metal. The links are there though. Mortis, for example, credited experimental German bands like Kraftwerk for inspiration. Here is Captain Carbon's theory, but many will reach the same conclusion independently. On a personal note, I even have a working theory that classic Dungeon Synth was a DIY adoption of the fantasy ambient that was created in the 1970s with Koschmisch music, and continued in the 1980s with New Age electronic music. As more releases are discovered, Dungeon Synth's history is becoming dotted with records that fit more into the history of electronic music than the birth of black metal. It is very possible the Dungeon Synth impulse, as it can be called, was absorbed by New Age, ambient, or electronic styles in the late 90s 2000s. 
German musicians were expanding massive synthesizer compositions into a commercial direction based on conceptual principles and aesthetics. Groups like the studio duo Cusco were producing thematic, conceptual albums in what would be called today a style akin to dungeon synth. The only problem is there is not the technology for independent personal production which made dungeon synth popular. This is likely where the missing link of the sparse 2000s rests. Cusco's Apuramac trilogy could each respectively be called Inca synth, Aztec or Maya synth, then Lakota slash Plain synth, and fit in on Bandcamp today. There's an entire video on them if you want to deep dive into a mysterious predecessor to Dungeon Synth. Dungeon Synth is very much a genre which is cohering in retrospect, but who set that in motion? It is rare that the true standardization of a genre can be laid at the feet of a single person, or blog. Andrew Wardena's Dungeon Synth blog is the closest one will come to a manifesto for Dungeon Synth. Though, as the writer admits, he was influenced by previous obscure metal blogs like Asmodee and Coven, but the Dungeon Synth blog had a unique mission to develop a genre in itself. Inaugurating it with the aforementioned Dungeon Synth post on March 17, 2011, to provide a definition for what was then a loose collection of music descended from black metal. Wordna largely started the blog to both coin the genre and because he wanted to find more music like it. Looking at the post on the 90s canon from May 2nd, 2017, one can see the composition of the genre laid out in definition. Mortis's Era 1 albums and side projects, Burzum's prison albums, and Wangraven's Feldtronen. Also the Austrian dark ambient band Summoning, which Wordna mentions as the exception due to their influence on modern ambient music. It is from this definition of the 90s canon core, or the core of Dungeon Synth, that the genre itself proceeded from in style. So where did the term Dungeon Synth, or DS, come from? Well, Andrew, but also Mortis. The earliest issue for the Dungeon Synth blog, before it was even established, was creating a simple name for this composite genre. Andrew thought it should be two words like most genres. He developed the term from Mortis's self-owned label Dark Dungeon Music, or Dark Dungeon Music USA. That is why Mortis is noted as having such a direct influence on Dungeon Synth as a genre. Andrew Warden originally wanted to use the term Dark Dungeon Music, or variations, but eventually settled on the term Dungeon Synth due to the production style. 2011 then can be pegged as the year Dungeon Synth started as a named, defined, and catalogued genre, which independent musicians would begin to define themselves within after that 90s canon. The Dungeon Synth blog became the first major hub of Dungeon Synth on the internet until the genre began to branch out between 2013 and 2015. The Dungeon Synth Reddit board would be created on March 8, 2013, then the Dungeon Synth Archives YouTube channel would be created on November 21st, 2015. Bandcamp would be, and still is, the main venue for Dungeon Synth though. The Dungeon Synth blog would provide a centralization point though. Modern and major Dungeon Synth artists like Irong credit the Dungeon Synth blog as the first major pillar of Dungeon Synth as a genre. It allowed a centralized idea and description of the genre to be popularized. As Zero Intern on the Dungeon Synth forum described, Dungeon Synth is very much a genre that manifested and declared independence from other genres. Well, as Dungeon Synth has become diffused into its own culture, the Dungeon Synth blog is no longer as active as it once was, it still posts the occasional review and interview. It serves as a sort of prestige institution and symbol of the heritage for the genre. Andrew Wardena is still around too, and his incredible influence in outlining the genre, or maybe carving it out, is acknowledged. So, in retrospect, was there an actual Dungeon Synth tradition that was carried from the 90s through the 2000s to create the Dungeon Synth of the 2010s? There are three Dungeon Synth artists to note as sort of bridging that gap between eras, but not directly. Jim Kirkwood is one, but he is also the Dungeon Synth counterfactual as it were. Jim Kirkwood has been releasing his own, self-described, gothic electronic music since the 1980s and still does here and there today. That's at least 40 years, and he has released a lot of music over those 40 years. Outside fronting a black metal band in the 1980s, Kirkwood's discography is interesting because it has almost no links to the common accepted sources of Dungeon Synth. He actually predates most of them. Kirkwood is from the UK too, and was influenced by German electronic instead of Norwegian black metal music. As is obvious, Jim Kirkwood's discography is too expansive to analyze in sufficient detail here, but his early work tends towards a fantastic D&D style, and his later work towards more Christian literary themes. 
His Master of Dragons album, 1991, is considered one of the first major Dungeon Synth classics, but is more electronica than synth. Kirkwood's artistic style is itself now iconic in Dungeon Synth culture too, and is its own major influence on Dungeon Synth music. Lunar Room was a small, pre-Dungeon Synth project which released a few demos back in the mid to late 90s. As one can assume by now, it had links to black metal. Being a side project of Henry Trollhorn Sorali of both Moon Sorrow and Fin Troll fame, he is Finnish after all. If anything, Lunar Room is remarkable for being experimental folk ambient dungeon synth before the term dungeon synth existed, or maybe it's not even dungeon synth. Sorali is known for being somewhat of a virtuoso in that respect. Lunar Womb is interesting outside its ambient demos like Planets, 1996. After 15 years, Lunar Womb returned in 2015 during the Dungeon Synth revival with a third demo, The Sleeping Green, but also actually not. The Sleeping Green, or Demo 3, was actually a project Sorali had produced all the way back in 1999. He just kind of forgot about it, artwork and all, on an old computer, and The Sleeping Green did not truly see the light of day until 2015. Who knows what else sleeps on hidden hard drives, like dragons in caves. Another reemergent Dungeon Synth artist to acknowledge is Sir Nanos Woods, if that is how you say it. The project partially shares roots with Mortis. The album, Awaken the Empire of Darkwood, 1996, was released by Cruel Moon International, the international label of Cold Meat Industry which Mortis was signed to. The name makes obvious the very Celtic pagan or Druidic fantasy style of the material. Sernanus Woods veers towards experimental, with roots in neoclassical, and could be considered a predecessor to Dungeon Synth's more avant-garde wings. It has its admirers and detractors. Then, 20 years later, Sernanus Woods was revived in 2016 with Forest Anthology, a compilation of Sernanus Woods' demos and obscure works from the 1990s. Not exactly a return as in truly new material, but an effort in collecting material for the genre's chronology. Sernanus Woods can definitely be placed in the acquired taste recommendations for the already acquired taste of Dungeon Synth. Opinions on the material vary wildly, but it is another branch in the Dungeon Synth family tree that has to be acknowledged. But that then closes out the true predecessors to Dungeon Synth. Now, who defines themselves as a modern Dungeon Synth artist? The largest early name of note was the artist slash project Lord Leviticus, or Lord Lovidicus, occasionally two people depending. One of the contemporary styles Andrew Wardner considered to have embodied the aesthetics of Dungeon Synth. Lord Lovidicus, who are slash is still active to this day, actually came to define their work as Dungeon Synth due to the Dungeon Synth blog. Not surprising, as they had listed their major influences as both Burzum and Tolkien. Lord Lovidicus' third album is even named Quinta Cimmerillion, 2010. The important thing to note about them is their material predates the terming of Dungeon Synth in 2011. Wind Buchen was released in 2009, Journey to Beleriand in 2010, the aforementioned Quinta Cimmerillion in 2010, Trolldom in 2010, a big hitter in early Dungeon Synth circles, The Forge's Fire in 2010, Dala Burr's Ishii in 2010, and Arcane in 2010. It was a major outpouring of sound before the project directly considered itself to be Dungeon Synth. Most modern Dungeon Synth artists, aware or not, are technically downstream from Lord Leviticus's work and influence then due to that output alone. While Lord Lovidicus was a major component of the Dungeon Synth revival, it was not a personality. They admit their material tends towards the composer instead of the performer. The first major personality of modern Dungeon Synth would be Rong. He is French. Why does he wear the mask? Andrew Werner credits Arong's Tome 1, 2012, for finally cobbling together the disparate elements of Dungeon Synth into a cohesive modern vision. Arong's Tome series being a milestone in Dungeon Synth as a genre, Arong was one of the first who set out to be a Dungeon Synth artist, to embrace the pure conceptual fantasy of Dungeon Synth without trying to root his work in any other genre. Arong was after all a reader of the Dungeon Synth blog, and highly active in current Dungeon Synth circles. Most of Irong's music is derived from memories and nostalgia, often manifested in his fantasy world or concept of the Land of the Five Seasons, or Land of Five Seasons, a land of magic where all seasons occur at once, and populated by Irong's characters. 
His image of the land and music is defined by secrets and mysteries which mean something to him, often represented in his music by obscure samples. The man is known to record silence of certain places just to use as backing tracks for his music. Silence. While his roots are conceptually in Dungeon Synth, Irong's Land of the Five Seasons is not tied to Dungeon Synth alone. His 2016 album, Anti-Future, is his style in a retro-futurist 1980s cyberpunk style, or future synth. Irong's often admitted to a heavy influence from both John Carpenter's synthworks and Brian Eno's ambient music, so Anti-Future is more of a send-up to them if anything. He did it again with Endless Realms and Nostalgic Gods in 2018, the Land of the Five Seasons rendered in an American Western sound and style. It's cinematic and even makes some nods at both metal, techno, and even American folk music. Irong, if anything, is flexible. He is well known online, active on YouTube, and if one has ever investigated Dungeon Synth before, they have probably run into his Two Hours of Dungeon Synth and Fantasy Music by Irong full albums video. One of the more major compendiums of Dungeon Synth which got the general public interested in the genre due to YouTube recommendations. Okay, why the mask then? Is it another example of Mortis's long shadow on Dungeon Synth? Well, partially, but also no. Irong is equal parts character and musician. He is interesting because he represents how varied the influences of Dungeon Synth can be. Ultimately, the mask seems to originate due to Irong's early love for Barouille Noir, a French punk band from the 1980s who are known for their masks and radical performances both on album and on the stage. Barouille Noir is largely unknown on the English internet. One could actually wager Irong is better known to English speakers than Barouille Noir, but punk isn't my specialty. Barouille Noir was one of the first bands, as Irong admits on his YouTube channel, that showed him how different music could be. Beside the usual dungeon synth topics like Lord of the Rings, board games, and metal, Irong also says video games like Zelda 3, The Secret of Mana, and old computer RPGs hold a special place to him and in his music. The Secret of Mana soundtrack especially. Influence from video games and video game OSTs would come to be a defining force in new slash modern dungeon synth. Irong, for example, says he works on programs that are about 15 years old to make sure he gets that proper sound. Irong takes himself as more of a craftsman rather than artist. King of Nothing, Slave to No One, 2017, is perhaps his sound best distilled down to a single album. It alternates between cinematic, fantastic, and even joyous or playful, a place where Irong excels in bringing back the daydream fantasies of foreign lands and other worlds. If one is intimidated by the Tome series, which by now has reached about 10 volumes slash albums, King of Nothing, Slave to No One, is an excellent introduction to Arang and a sampler for the plethora of what Dungeon Synth can be. The easiest, concise on-ramp to the style. Here's how the man himself describes what Arang is supposed to be. Arang is the ghost of the shadows from the past. He wanders through the land of the five seasons. He is the magician behind the curtains, knowing what was and what will be. That's why he's wearing the skull mask. Even if my music is often sad and melancholy, I use my memories as a strength to create positive energy. That's what the skull mask illustrates, a laugh in the face of time and death. Irong, king of nothing and slave to no one. Dungeon Synth best exemplified. There are also a few other foundational albums of modern Dungeon Synth to acknowledge. Both Hedgewizard's More True Than Time Thought 2014 and Vin Calder's Enchantments of Olor 2015 both are considered modern Dungeon Synth classics. They exemplify the synth fantasy and dark mythology aspects that form Dungeon Synth. More True Than Time Thought is cryptic and haunting but in the code of English medieval style synths. Enchantments of Old Lore embraces the sweeping Germanic Nordic aspects and sound like an expansive icy pine forest gloom. Both obviously draw on Dungeon Synth's 1990s predecessors, but they are more a reformation on that sound rather than a continuation of it. Hedge Wizard aims more towards the low style production and sound, obviously aiming towards Dungeon Synth's origins in lo fi fantasy, and Vin Calder towards the epic emotions the genre can create in a sort of mythological aspect. Both are good, but Enchantments of Old Lore is probably more accessible due to its simple, cinematic, and clean sound. In both there is black metal, but it is only faint whispers left. 
One of the grandest Dungeon Synth epics also has to be mentioned, The Canterbury Tales, 2016, by Chaucerian Myth, not the book. It is considered a modern classic for the genre and a high watermark in Dungeon Synth's development. A three-hour, 28-minute concept album based on English author Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. The structure of the album in itself is based off the 14th century book of Body Pilgrim's Tales. The album has 25 tracks, with the opening track being dedicated to the book's opening prologue, then the other 24 being based off their respectively titled tales, each track varying in length depending on their respective tale and thematic elements. Canterbury Tales is high concept, but it is long and slow going even by Dungeon Synth standards, in a good way. Whereas most Dungeon Synth can be enjoyed in the background, the Canterbury Tales album is one that demands the listener's attention. The album uses its form and background in English literature to branch Dungeon Synth out into the wider cultural structure. Chaucerian myth often has the credit for opening Dungeon Synth up to wider concepts foreign to its origins. So what could such an internet micro-genre like Dungeon Synth become? Inspired by both popular entertainment and myth, Dungeon Synth in the mid-2010s was now coming under far newer and varied influences. The groundwork of synth, black metal, and tabletop fantasy was still there, but Dungeon Synth was becoming mature under its own name and style. The themes of fantasy, nostalgia, and escape were still there as well, but now interacting with things like internet aesthetics, JRPG soundtracks, and connecting with other genres like science fantasy or elements of high art. Anything that offered escapism, aesthetics, or substance could be blended into the concoction of Dungeon Synth. This though meant Dungeon Synth was slowly leaving the dungeon that gave it birth. There was a whole world of shining castles, bejeweled dragons, and singing bards above the dark crypts of that dungeon. New listeners who discovered Dungeon Synth through artists like Lord Leviticus, Irong, or even Chaucerian Myth, had no background with Andrew Werdner's 90s canon or the artists that inspired the concept of the genre. There was both a culture and genre shift that was bringing Dungeon Synth in name to new audiences, as happens with all music eventually. The album's 1 to 5 by Fief represents this development best in modern Dungeon Synth. Fief's albums are still rooted in the fantasy Dungeons and Dragons esque aesthetics of early Dungeon Synth, but much lighter and happier. Warm colors like sunlight yellows, summer oranges, autumn reds, and sea blues decorate their albums colors totally foreign to the gloom of classic Dungeon Synth. Their music is more about a sense of adventure on the horizon, rather than the gloomy foreboding of a dungeon. Fief, downstream from a wrong in a way, focuses on that melody of nostalgia as it were, but in the mode of a tabletop or video game RPG. Their work has best been described in YouTube comments as save room music, being the gentle calmness in a world of adventure. This has allowed Fief to tap into audiences outside Dungeon Synth. People unfamiliar with the concept see it as a video game OST without the video game, so just an original soundtrack. Fief is both a modern and tasteful entrance to Dungeon Synth as a genre, if one prefers the happier elements. Do not take them as a total departure from Dungeon Synth, though. The lineage is still there. Modern Dungeon Synth artists still regularly tip their hats back to its origins and predecessors in the 1990s-slash 1980s. For example, even if done in other styles, Dungeon Synth albums are still regularly sold slash printed on cassettes for sale on Bandcamp. Why is that? It partially has to do with nostalgia and the retro nature of Dungeon Synth in itself. Dungeon Synth label Ancient Metal Records best explains the tradition in their About Us section. Ancient Metal Records releases music exclusively on antiquated forms of media, cassette, compact disc, vinyl records, as an affront to the rampant overconsumption and bastardization of independent music by mainstream society. Ancient Metal Records boasts an ideology and environment of self-sufficiency, do-it-yourself work ethic, fellowship, and admiration for the simplicity of the old ways. Cassette tapes are tangible, warm, and utilitarian. Cassettes bring back the tactile, olfactory, smellier tapes and their inserts, and visual experience of music. Cassettes can be traded for other cassettes, or traded for other tangible goods between friends. Cassettes can be shared. Digitized music lacks all of these wonderful facets of life. And such beliefs are not restricted to Dungeon Synth labels. No one is going to get rich off Dungeon Synth, which gives it a sort of anti-commercial aspect and attraction. 
Is that not strange for what, in modern form, is essentially a near-pure internet genre? Not really. Dungeon Synth is able to embrace both poles without issue due to being a composer-based genre. A majority of Dungeon Synth artists, or makers, are anonymous or simply go by their screen names. This allows the concept to present itself rather than have someone present the genre or the idea. The popular post-2011 Dungeon Synth artists who can be called personalities can be counted on about one hand. Even then, it's often the fictional musical identity that overtakes the personality of the artist behind the mask. It is mostly, if not all, semi-anonymous. All one needs is a computer, a music program, and a Bandcamp or YouTube account. There is no establishment for Dungeon Synth, and it is not yet clear if the genre is even really profitable overall. It is a business or passion of long, complex tracks made at night, usually by people with day jobs or who are in college. The Dungeon Synth Archives channel on YouTube has become one of the central hubs for Dungeon Synth on YouTube. Opened on November 21st, 2015, the archives, thanks to YouTube recommendations, have been one of the main vectors of spread for the genre and had a major hand in its post-2015 popularity, mainly through the ability to bring attention to lesser-known artists' work and more obscure albums from the 1990s. A majority of the people who now like Dungeon Synth and know of it as a genre probably discovered it through the archives. Consider the Dungeon Synth archives to have created the third generation of Dungeon Synth enthusiasts. The first generation came from the Andrew Werdena slash the Dungeon Synth blog, the second generation from Growth on Bandcamp, then the third from the Dungeon Synth archives on YouTube. With more than 80k subscribers and 15 million views, the channel represents Dungeon Synth breaching the surface of obscurity as it were. While there is no mainstream on the internet, Dungeon Synth now has a substantial presence on the semi-open web. Proliferation of Dungeon Synth on YouTube has led to an explosion of experimentation and divergences. It seems 2019-2020 may have represented the turning to another new era for Dungeon Synth. The seeds laid in the early 2010s were coming to fruition by the end of the decade. Dungeon Synth was now a genre on its own. Then, suddenly, it was developing subgenres or branches. With a still developing amoeba like Dungeon Synth, it is hard to tell, but post-2019, there are now new lineages branching out from the main tree. This will be a brief review of the tiny mushroom genres popping up out of Dungeon Synth as of recent. The Grandma's Cottage albums, Grandma's Cottage 2019, Grandma's Cottage 2019, Memory Box 2020, and Precious Moments 2021 are largely responsible for producing the subgenre of Comfy Synth. Comfy, or maybe Cozy Synth, removes the larger Dungeon Synth concepts, besides soft storybook fluff, to focus more on the warmth of memories and nostalgia in production. Grandma's Cottage, for example, is supposed to sound like your grandma's house, or an idealized example of a grandma's house. Warm tea in winter, kitschy paintings, and family gatherings. A lo-fi reenactment of childhood nostalgia, maybe even a childhood one has never experienced. As much as Dungeon Synth is of the crypt, Comfy Synth is of your grandma's parlor and old rugs. There is sometimes a winter element in it, because snowfall is just cozy, but that is not always so. There are plenty of other elements and settings of Comfy Synth, but Comfy Synth is predicated on being smaller than Dungeon Synth. The Cherry Cordial albums, for example, still retain an element of high fantasy storybook, but are highly influenced by Brian Jake's Redwall novels and other small animal media. As Cherry Cordial's creator, Zach Kiernan, has described, Comfy Synth favors major key melodies rather than Dungeon Synth's minor scale. That gives Comfy Synth a fuller, more familiar chiming sound like a fairy tale instead of an epic fantasy. A lot of Comfy Synth has to do with tiny fantasies like storybook mice, gnomes, or cats, but none of that is a requirement. Tootson's The Safety of Prosperity, 2021, is a marriage between Comfy Synth, Dungeon Synth, and medieval or baroque music. It is both ominous as it is cozy or comfy. Both Tootson and Sherry Cordial show synth painted with brighter colors and whimsy. Both represent what happens when Dungeon Synth becomes more of a daydream rather than a fantasy. If one wants more, there is even a Comfy Synth Archives in the vein of the Dungeon Synth Archives on YouTube. But is there something bigger than Dungeon Synth? Bigger and more ancient?
literally coming out of the lost world, there is Dino Synth. Whereas Dungeon Synth loves D&D and fantasy, Comfy Synth loves storybooks and fairy tales, Dino Synth loves dinosaurs and movies. Dino Synth is the popular image of prehistoric life, dinosaur fiction, and the lost world, or land of the lost media, distilled into a synth genre. Like Dungeon Synth, it is highly concept-based, but with retro dinosaur growls and old movie sound effects hammered in. It's more ominous than Dungeon Synth 2, with the intention of making the listener feel they are in a world they are much too small for. Maybe it's also a bit too humid and a bit too ancient for them. Diplodocus's albums, Slow and Heavy, 2019, both A and B side, and Tales of an Ancient Past, 2020, are the codifiers and popularizers of the dinosynth micro subgenre. There's also Slow and Heavy Tyrannic Edition, but that just combines the Slow and Heavy A and B side together with a bonus track. Diplodocus makes one truly feel they are in a Jurassic jungle, maybe filmed on a studio backlot, but it is still incredibly humid and they are hunted by lumbering beasts behind every tree. With tracks named things like Encased in Amber, Return of the Thunder Lizard, and, one of the best, Faint Burning Glimmer in the Mesozoic Sky, one knows what kind of sepia-tone, stop-motion world they are being transported to. Faint Burning Glimmer in the Mesozoic Sky can almost make a person feel bad for the apocalyptic fate that Slow and Heavy's A-side concludes with as life finds a way. Suddenly, one has just listened to an entire dinosaur concept album without lyrics and only some growling sound effects. How's that feel? Shoutouts to Diplodocus for taking the dinosynth aesthetic the entire way. Are there any other exemplars of dinosynth? Like comfy synth, it is a subgenre of basically a subgenre still awaiting innovators, but there are a few in the field. Synthosaurus's albums are noteworthy, but they have a definite heavy metal sound. Dinosynth 2 likes to tip his hat back to black metal origins, especially their albums Gigantic Throne 2020 and the Prehistoric Gods 1 Plus 2 2020 albums. But Synthosaurus is still Dinosynth. Whereas Diplodocus is more cinematic and interested in ambience, Synthosaurus is more about the brutality of beasts and the clash of titans. Dinosaur battles, basically. People who like Dungeon Synth may think that it may be a little too much, but those open to metal will like how the songs have a lot fuller sound to enjoy. There's a lot going on in each one. Dino Synth even has a sort of parody, or maybe it's a serious parody? It's pretty good. Neanderthalensis, short and stocky, 2020. The title being an obvious play on Diplodocus's Slow and Heavy. What is it then? Neanderthal Synth, basically, or more Neanderthal Ambient. Evolve to synth tones. Theoretically, one could eventually combine comfy and dino synth into a cross genre mixture, something like The Land Before Time. The interesting thing Grandma's Cottage and Diplodocus are by the same artist. As is usual, besides some Bandcamp information, the artist behind both projects is near anonymous. But both Grandma's Cottage and Diplodocus are associated with the Dungeons Deep label interesting possible example of cross-pollination between dungeon synth subgenres. Sick of the past though, what about the future? Science fantasy synth? It does exist. The Knights of Vrol, or Vrol, sorry about the pronunciation, are a little cryptic, but these albums scratch the itch for an adventure among the mystic stars. The cover of Sword of Ionheart 2021 should be enough to attract the curious listener. It brings the lo-fi sounds of Dungeon Synth to space, or more a new genre, while still retaining the lo-fi production style. The track Mirror Moon pushes the boundaries of what Dungeon Synth is and can be. Knights of Nvrol, or Vrol, aim for a mysterious new world, or a kingdom among the stars. Atrium of Time's self-titled album, Atrium of Time 2022, also deserves attention. Based on American author Gene Wolfe's Book of the New Sun series slash cycle, the album's concept is based around the first book of the series, The Shadow of the Torturer, and it seems the rest will follow if fate will allow. Like the book series, it offers the ominous sounds of a world so close to Earth, but one that is also totally not. Atrium of Time has a sound both blacker than black, Fulgen, and whiter than white, Argent, 
The Wonders of Earth and Sky is an excellent track to get the taste even if one has no background on Gene Wolfe or the Book of the New Sun source material. Maybe pick up the book while you listen? Dungeon Synth is after all best enjoyed as ambiance, or perhaps while reading some books of lore. Outside that, here are some miscellaneous but interesting albums that did not fit into any prior category. Which is Moon, Black Moon Kiss EP, 2017. The first Dungeon Synth album I ever recall hearing. I probably liked it because it sounded like Halloween and the Dark Cloud 2 slash Dark Chronicle OST. Witch's Moon as a project seems finished, but Black Moon Kiss is and will always be eerily romantic. Golden Fleece, The Journey to Colchis, 2017. Minimalistic dungeon synth based on Greek mythology, largely the Argonautica. I like it because Jason and the Argonauts, 1963, is one of my favorite movies. Golden Fleece, as of now, looks to be a one-and-done project, but I always come back to this album for its unique sound and sort of metallic nature. Urpale, Water Tombs and Crimson Horizons, 2018. Urpale, in general, is one of the best current dungeon synth artists with a heavy neoclassical orchestral style, basically about aquatic high seas adventures, and who does not want to be a pirate? One cannot deny an album with tracks titled things like Ice Rapiers, Floral Sorcery, and Mist Weaver's Galleon. Umbria, the Entombed Wizard, 2021. Umbria is the current Dungeons and Sweetheart, and the title is well deserved as of recent output. Others have already gushed about the Entombed Wizard elsewhere, but it truly does show the fantastical vein of Dungeons and has not yet been depleted. Once more, enter the Crystal Spire. So, a short introduction. That covers about 30 or 40 years of a genre, which has only existed a name for slightly more than a decade. Dungeon Synth is invigorating because anyone can explore it like this. While an effort has been made to outline a canon for the genre, it truly still does not have one. Albums both new and old may so soon be bent into the dazzling structure of Dungeon Synth, the alloy of a new musical experience. What actually is Dungeon Synth, though? Well, just hop over to Bandcamp and see if you can find out. As Arong says, imagination never fails. Ah yes, but is your synth album forklift certified? From the catacombs, I'd like to give a special thanks to my supporter, the Gel Samini family.